first of all, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, Colossians 3. Colossians 3. I told the teenagers about end of December, early January, my devotions, I was reading here, and you ever read something that just hits you right smack dab between the eyes? And then you kind of reread it and reread it. And that's what happened here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And I read, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And then as I continued to read, I saw verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. And as I was reading that, I was reminded, I said, I, I've read that before somewhere. And I was trying to bog my mind. And then I, of course, turned back here to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. And that's our third area to look at, verse 31. And the scripture says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So as a result of seeing that and cross-referencing and reminding myself that still today, the greatest reference you can read or the greatest commentary you can read on the Bible is still the Bible, okay? The fact that you can co connect the dots and see so many things here. So two weeks ago, we taught on verse 17. We said, what does it mean to whatsoever ye do do it all in the name of Jesus. And we said, basically, to do it in the name of Jesus, whatever it is you're doing, three things. Is it, it answers these questions. Is it consistent with the character of Christ? Right. To do it in the name of Jesus, it answers that question. It also answers the question, does it carry the authority of Christ? And then thirdly, we answer this question, does it culminate to the praise of Christ? And then last week, verse 23, we answered and said this, what does it mean to whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord? And uh, we taught there that we're talking about going wholehearted, not half-heartedly. And uh, we said wholeheartedly or heartily, um, there's a preparation to do something heartily. And that's the discipline we need to have. Then we said there's the performing of heartily, and that's the decision. So once you've made the preparations, the decision is a lot easier. And so we talked about and said, we, I kind of mentioned how, I said nothing looks worse than watching a child who's playing a sport that their parents signed up and made them do that they didn't want to do. I've been reffing on the side here and over at the YMCA or different uh, little children's centers and places like that, you'll see little Jeremiah running down the court. And if he can dribble the ball three times, that'd be a, that'd be a success, okay? And he just, when, the, when it's done, the, all nine players are running down there and he's just looking at the lights. And you hear those parents on the side, run, Jeremiah, run! And he, he's like trying to, oh, they're down there. And so he starts running. Now, they've already turned the ball over and they're coming this way, but he's just running down this way. And he gets to that one spot that his coach tells him, Jeremiah, when you need to be, and he, and he gets there and he jumps. And he looks over at mom and dad like. <laughs> then they throw the ball at him and hits him in the face. He starts crying and he never wants to play basketball again. But these parents sign him up. No, you're going to play. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to play. And I told our kids, you know, nothing looks worse than that. And I said, no, I found out what looks worse than that. Is when a teenager is on the church property, and you can tell, just like little Jeremiah, that they're just there because mom and dad said to come. And the Bible says, children, obey your parents. And then I got to honor my parents. But boy, when I graduate, you just wait. When I can spread these wings, and I said, you know what, just as you can see it in the little Jeremiah's of the little rec leagues, you can see it in the life of a teenager when they're not heartily, wholeheartedly doing something for the Lord. And so we taught about that. And tonight we're going to go from this last passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. And I want to talk about this. Whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory Amen. of God. It says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So tonight, what does that mean? Number one, why 
If we're going to do this, we need to think through it. Let's make it logical, but I know if we can say the Bible says it, just do it. I understand that. But why are we to glorify God? Well, let's turn to Revelation chapter 4, and we'll see verse number 11 here. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. I want to make sure this isn't three points Brother Clint's trying to convince you to do. I want you to see from Scripture how it totally makes sense of why we should glorify God. Revelation 4, verse number 11, the Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. I want to remind all of us here that we are created beings. And when the designer created us, he created us for one purpose and one purpose only. To be happy? Nope. To be successful? Nope. Oh, to, 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 to really stuff that bank account? Nope. Oh, to have a two-car garage and to be able to put two cars in it and still have a third one on the side on blocks that we need for parts to help the other two cars in the gut? No. Those are all secondary things. Right. The main reason you were designed by your creator was to give him glory. Amen. He takes pleasure in you giving him glory. Amen. You put a smile on his face when you give him glory yes. because you're doing what he created you to do. And so when you see this, because he created this, uh, us, if we, because he created us, if we do not give God glory, we are not giving him pleasure in that which he created. Now, there are some who don't recognize God as a creator and that's their choice. The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. Did you just call people full? No, I was just quoting scripture. But if the shoe fits, then for the rest of us, I can say this. If creation alone, and that verse doesn't do it for you, can I remind you that he didn't just create us, he loved us. And he didn't just create us and love us, he gave himself for us to prove his love for us. And if you understand that, then you've probably done this and know that he has saved us who have put their faith and trust in him as their personal savior. And as a result of that, we can give God glory. Why are we to glorify God answers the questions of why am I here and what is my purpose? I don't need a 32 chapter book about the purpose of my life for God when I know in scripture it says I'm to glorify him with my life. Now, we can argue about the purpose of certain things. For instance, I heard a well-renowned preacher a few weeks ago speak about the importance of a dog. And that we should not value a dog's life over a human's life. And I think we all agree with that. But if you ask yourself this question, what is the purpose of a dog? And let's say we were to go to Pastor John White, who has a great Pyrenees dog named Chief. And if we were to go, what's the purpose of Chief over there on Tickle Road? He'd say, to guard the chickens, keep the coyotes out, right? And just bark everything else that could be a danger. Keep the black snakes out and keep everything away. That's his purpose. And I'd say, okay, great, that's good for you. But Miss Wanda, we can also argue that a purpose of a dog could be for companionship, right? And that it would be okay that if they're not too dirty or messy, that they could come in the house, right? And, and just lay around with the rest of the family maybe. And maybe even climb up on the couch and take pictures with and just to be a companion with. There's some who could argue that that's the purpose of a dog, right? And many would agree with Miss Wanda, and there's others who would agree with my pastor and say, no, nah, he's outside, he's in the field, that's where he belongs, just let him know. That's great, no problem. There's another group. In fact, he was a student. Honey, I don't know if you remember when he was at Golden State Baptist College and we taught him. His name was Jamel, his name still is, <laughs> Jamel Hamka. He likes using dogs too, preacher. In fact, he does a lot more with dogs. He breeds dogs. He breeds champion English retrievers. Not, don't, don't call them white retrievers. They're cream color. They're Rochestershire retrievers, 
in their kennel at Statesville, North Carolina. There's about 11 ladies and nine studs that he has in his area. Brother Alec Hutchins works there for him. He's in charge of their media and everything. If you want a puppy from that kennel, they start at $18,000. That's with, <laughs> I, wrote, I, I looked it up, that's with 450 hours of training and all the certified papers that come with it of who his parents were and what they've won and this and that. If you want the puppy that's been trained for 600 hours, well, then that's going to cost you $21,000. But if you want the one that's been trained for 850 hours, get out $28,000 and go get you a puppy from Statesville, North Carolina. Now, each group can argue about livestock, work, that's what he's supposed to do, companionship, and breeding. One group can look at another and go, I just don't understand it. And one group can, oh, they need to be careful. And one group can, well, you can all do that, but you can never, never argue the fact that we were created for one purpose. Not one of three or one of many, but one purpose, to give God glory. The second thing I see is this, not just why are we to glorify God, but how are we to glorify God? What does it mean to glorify God? Well, by Webster's definition, to glory means this, to praise or rejoice proudly. To praise or rejoice proudly. There are some folks over here in this first pew who as a result of some events that took place Sunday night after church... I'm sure they were happy about the Sunday night service as well, but Sunday night after church, their favorite team, the New England Patriots, won, and they were rejoicing proudly. I don't even have to, I'm sure. Have the shirts been ordered? Or have they been delivered? Not yet. Okay, but, but the, the, the championship Patriot shirts have been ordered. Brother Jimmy, it'd be nice some, some decade if we could ever have that problem, right? To, to order a championship shirt for our Cowboys. Uh, but, but, but yeah, good. This is just Andy's, Andy, just think of the age Andy is. He knows nothing except Tom Brady going to Super Bowls and AFC championships. Poor guy. And uh, man, when reality sits in after he retires, Andy, I'll pray for you. But uh, as we see what happens here to praise or rejoice proudly, you ask them about the game Sunday and they'll start talking in their ears. Oh man, you know, we, we, we forced so many punts and that was the the best defensive thing ever, and this was, and you're going to be, man, you guys must like the Patriots. What would you be accused of liking if someone had a 10-minute conversation with you? Would they, would, would they have a 10-minute conversation and say, boy, he really likes fishing. Boy, she really loves uh, decorating shows, man, with this and then, uh, boy, she really likes to cook. Man, he really loves baseball. Boy, da, da, da. Or could they say, man, they, they really... They really love the Lord. Amen. Right. To praise or rejoice proudly. You will not praise or rejoice proudly about anything that you do not appreciate. God blessed us with children. We have three, two very, very wonderful children in Tabitha. And um, <laughs> it's because you're here, sweetie. God gave us three beautiful children. I remember... I remember that first birth. I remember all of them. Not as good as my wife does, but I remember them. I think it was a Friday. We thought she was ready to go in, and then so we got everything ready, and we got ready to go, and then she said she wasn't ready to go, and I was like, hm, women. And um, <laughs> but that Saturday morning, I do know for sure we got in there, and I'm very, 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 very sure it was a Saturday because UCLA was playing football that afternoon. And um, we were in that room what seemed forever. And uh, the maternity nurse was coming in and out, checking, are you ready? No, we're not ready. Oh, my back, oh, this, oh, that. And uh, I remember one time the nurse was trying to settle my wife down, and she grabbed her cheeks and got about this far. I was like, okay, Debbie, we're going to have this baby soon. All right, now you just settle down. And my wife's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the nurse stepped out, and my wife goes, honey, can you reach in my bag? I said, yeah. She says, there's some breath mints in there. Give them to our nurse. <laughs> We, uh, the pain was getting, it was going on and on, and the football game was winding down. 
I know Nancy was coming up that afternoon and I asked if she could bring a pizza and she did, thank you. And so I'm holding Debbie's hand, trying to help her, trying to finish the football game and eat my pizza. Whoo, you talk about a rough afternoon. <laughs> and so um, I think at one point we agreed to have the epidural and so they got my wife on the edge of the bed. They asked if I could assist. So I was on the standing on the side of the bed. She was seated. And, Arms around me, I was holding her up. I was her rock. I was her foundation. I was there for her. And I had a great view of them pointing that needle in and everything. And the next thing I know, I'm in a chair in the corner of the room with three nurses around me fanning me. <laughs> Mr. Fredericks, are you okay? I'm like, why am I eating ice chips? <laughs> so I wanted to switch spots and take the bed from my wife, but... Uh, that needle man got the best of me. And it was about 9 p.m. that night, 10 p.m. The doctors finally said, okay, we're just going to have to take the baby. And I didn't know all the verbiage. I meant, oh, my goodness, is it dead? And they're like, no, no, take it. We're going to have to do a C-section. I said, okay. And so uh, they laid my wife down like a human sacrifice, strapped her arms down, laid this curtain down, and I was kind of in the middle, right? I was like, hey, honey. And... Uh, and as they performed the service and everything and uh, whatever you call it, uh, I saw the instruments, I saw the tools, I heard the It sounded like more of a dentist office than a doctor's office. And next thing you knew, man, they're like, here he is. And I was like, <laughs> and I looked at my son and his head went up and it went Woo, over like that. And I was kind of like, um, you know, I got that curtain. My wife's over here. I'm like. <laughs> then I hear my wife, honey. I was like, hey, yeah, well, good job, babe. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, is that treatable? And they're like, what? I'm thinking he has a tumor or he's the Antichrist and that's one horn. And 30 years later, the second one will pop out. I, I wasn't ready for that. All the videos we watch, that was not part of it. And they start laughing. They're like, oh, it's so cute. I said, oh, yeah, keep laughing to the, to the lawyer call, okay? All right, just keep laughing. And, honey, how's, oh, honey, it's a boy. You did good. You did good. What's he look like? I'm like, uh, definitely your side of the family. <laughs> He's a Haston, right? And, uh, and, uh, and, that, and I found out, you know, they said it happens. All, that's why they put them stinking beanies on the heads real quick to, to, to cover all the evidence. And so... Um, I said, what? He said, no, 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 just give him about 24 hours. It just because he was inside and it just got mushy. And I was like, so I felt it. I was like, yeah, it is mushy, you know? And, and then there's that thin part right on top that you got to be careful because if you poke it, they'll just float all around the room like a broken balloon. No, that won't happen. But you're going to try it, I know. But, but, but it was. It was squishy, soft, and he was just stuck for, in one position for 14 hours. And, and uh, so finally everything. But I remember must have been 10 p.m., 10.30, I think it was, and I, pre-cell phone, right? I ran to this thing, and I did the uh, collect call, <laughs> all right, and, uh, and, and I called, and I said, hello, Grandma, and I called my mom, and I said, Deb did great, and it's a boy, Timothy, Jonathan, Hiapo, Fredericks, and da 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 da, -da. gave, uh, and, and, uh, and it was just quiet on the other end, and uh, you know what? For the first time in my life, I really considered what my mom went through to give birth to, to, to us three boys, Kevin, myself, and Chris. And, um, you know, I'm not saying there were far advancements from the 60s and 70s when ladies gave birth to 1997 when my wife did, but I know it was probably a little better in 97 than it was in the 60s and 70s, right? And I just stopped, and for the first time, preacher, I said, hey, mom, Thanks for giving birth to me. I don't know if I've ever thanked you for that. And I sure appreciate all that you went through to give me life. Amen. And can I tell you, in the life of a Christian, it's very much the same. That's right. When you'll stop and consider what had to take place to give you spiritual life, Amen. you'll appreciate it and in turn you'll be able to rejoice and to talk proudly about the fact that I've been born again. Amen. And when you do that, can I tell you what happens? 
you're fulfilling the purpose with which God created you for. Amen. How are we to glorify God? <laughs> our actions, our words, they either lift up our testimony or they either tear it down. <laughs> Listen to these scripture verses, John 15, 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. Amen. You want to glorify God? Bear much fruit. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Look, we don't do actions and do things to get saved. We do actions and do things because we're saved. And as a result of that, we're giving God glory, and that's what he created us for in the first place. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Peter 4, 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. That was our, that's our text verse. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ might be upon me. I'd rather suffer and be in an infirmity with the power of Christ on my life than to be on a mountaintop all by myself. How are we to glorify God? Why are we to glorify God? And then thirdly, when? When are we to glorify God? In everything we do? <laughs> we just read, whether therefore we eat or drink, we're to give glory to God. So, so, so let's try to avoid, I've tried to teach this to our teenagers, to avoid that napkin prayer, right, when we go to fast food restaurants. I like to pray on the bus to help them because sometimes when we get in, I think they just order their food and just become, you know, ravenous teenagers. Mmm, eat food, yeah. <laughs> more, more. You eating that? You finishing that? Give me more. But y'all, sometimes I'll catch them doing their prayer. Dear Lord, bless us. The old napkin prayer, right? Because obviously if we pray in public at Dario, maybe the Gestapos are going to come out with their AK-47s and put us in prison. Absolutely not. But if you appreciate and can rejoice proudly, you would wholeheartedly just bow your head and pray. Amen. Whether therefore you eat or drink or, okay, so when we eat and when we drink and then what else? Whether therefore you eat or drink or, I don't know, whatsoever you do. So anything else, do all to the glory of God. In our actions, whatever we do, we are to bring glory to the Lord. And if it will not bring Him glory, we probably shouldn't do it. You see, it's not rules we need to come into and say, all right, you know, sometimes our teen choir sang tonight. Sometimes when we go out to sing at a church or this or that, I may say this. All right, fellas, let's not wear any denim. If we can wear maybe a shirt with a tie or a shirt with a collar and some khakis, let's make sure we do. Ladies, Miss Fredericks will tell you what we want to expect to wear on that. But, 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 but conforming to a dress code for an activity does not give God the glory as much as it does to say this. God, does this outfit honor you Amen. or dishonor you? God, does this language I'm going to use honor you or dishonor you? Amen. Brother Todd, is Brother Todd here? I thought I saw him playing. He's a referee. And, uh, and sometimes you get partnered with certain people that, yeah, you like working with them, this and that, but, but I'm new into this, and so I'll get some partners, and one of the first things I do, hey, how you doing? I'm Clint Fredericks. I'm the youth pastor over at Freedom Baptist Church. Oh, all right, well, let, let, let's keep our eyes open. Let's try to maintain the game control. Let's watch for the, this team beat them last time. Da, da, da. That is so much better. Every now and then, preacher, I've, maybe my partner got there a little bit late or this or that, so we didn't have the formal introduction. And in the first half, we're talking timeouts. We meet, and boy, he's, you would have thought he was, he was a sailor, Brother Jerry. And you would have thought he was roommates with you when you was in the sailor, man, when he was in the Navy. And, uh, and boy, at halftime, uh, we'll go and we'll drink some water. and go, so what do you do full time? I said, I'm a youth pastor. He goes, oh, 
I'm sorry for the language I used around you. Now, I don't stop and preach a message to him and say, you should be sorry for using that language around God himself. In fact, you used his name three times during the first half. But I'm going to make sure they know that I'm not going to use that language, and I sure would appreciate it if you don't. When do we glorify God? Now. As soon as you've been born again, you ought to start practicing. You know why? Because we're going to do it in heaven. Revelation 19.1, After these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. We're just going to keep singing and singing and praising and praising and giving God glory. The marshals are here and your daughter Eden has been coming to junior church. She won a ticket last week in junior church. And she didn't win it because she knew all the words to the songs, but she was really trying. There were some songs maybe she wasn't used to hearing in a junior church service. She knew some of them, and she was doing good. But I remember watching her during. We sang walk, walk. Walk, walk, walk the Bible way. Read your Bible daily, don't forget to pray. Walk, walk, walk the Bible way. Read your Bible every day. Smoking, drinking, fist fights, and dirty talk. They all make you walk a dirty walk. Smoking, drinking, fist fights, and dirty talk. Jesus says, and all the kids scream, no. Man, she didn't know the words, but she was watching all, and she was trying to keep up, and, and, uh, she, was, uh, and she was doing that. I was like, man, she's trying. She was just new. She got the reward anyway because, you know, there's some kids who've been coming in, and they're like, oh, we're singing that one again. Yeah, yeah, we are. And, uh, and, uh, but, but I'm afraid some of us, when we get to heaven, we may have been saved for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I'm afraid for some of us who might get up there, you're going to be going, well, how do we sing that one? How do we? How, uh, if we're going to be doing it for all of eternity, you may as well get a head start while we're down here. In conclusion, I'm going to end it the same way I began it. So teenagers, you know the answer to this. When I ask you this, three services ago. Do you want to give God your worst or give God your best? Right. And I kind of was tricking them on it, preacher. They said, well, we want to give them our best. I said, no. I said, you cannot give him your best until you give him your worst. You see, you want to hold on to all this and overcome it, but you got to give it to God. So give God your bad attitude. Give God your profanity, your cruelty, your rudeness, your low self-esteem, your casual drink, a puff or snuff here or there, your selfishness, your sin, whatever vice it is that you're battling. Well, when I overcome that, then I'll give God my best. You ain't going to overcome it. Right. You give your worst to God. And you cast all your care upon him and you give it to the Lord and in return you can give him your best by whatsoever you do. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Can't do that until you give him your worst. And then whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. You can't do that until you give him your worst. And whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That is your best. And you can only do that after you give him your worst.